Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jayatri Das, Chief Bioscientist here at the Franklin Institute. And we are back with another edition of Ben's Roundtable. Uh, I'm joined today by our science team, Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer, and Daryl Williams, our resident engineer and senior VP of Science and Education. And we have a special guest today, Emily Midwig, our collections manager, who is going to join our conversation about what's current uh, in science and technology with a look at how some an eye to the past can actually help us understand what's going on right now. So as always, we are interested in your questions. Please send them to us uh, in the chat and we'll get to them as we go along. Um, and, you know, of course, we all, we're always here with our hot takes and <laughs> controversial opinions on, on all things science. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Derek, you are up first. Um, and we're, you had talked about some planetary real estate questions, which, you know, made me wonder, like, man, like, uh, real estate prices are going up right now. What's happening in the universe? Hey, I have some cheap real estate for you if you're interested. <laughs> and the only problem is it's a location situation. And I'm really talking about the moon. Uh, often I get questions from people about what does it really mean when I get offered an opportunity to buy real estate on the moon? Can I really buy a plot of land on the moon? And it's a really great question because you might think that's possible. Well, as it turns out, there are some rules and regulations against this. The Outer Space Treaty of 1967 says, no, you can't buy land on the moon. And you might think it's for something, some mundane reason like, well, how do you get there? Or how do we map out the location? And how do you get there to do anything with it? But it's really connected to something else that goes way further back. And it is the idea that the moon is not a place that can be owned by any country on Earth. And this comes through the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. And it was agreed by um, 160 countries that nobody can actually own the land, own the moon. And now what that means is that a person can't own land either because it was never originally owned by another country. So that takes care of that. If you were planning to buy some real estate, Forget it, you can't buy real estate on the moon, right? So, so you... Derek, can I, can I interrupt you for a second? Because yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in a little bit of the backstory because you said that this, this treaty was done in 1967, right? Yes. So this is like right in the thick of the space race. Yes. So fact, was this kind of a way to just like cool things down? Well, it was at a time when the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was really hot. And both of these countries were at that time uh, thinking about using space as a platform for militaristic behavior and uh, an opportunity, if you will, using Earth orbit as a platform from which they might be able to uh, do something aggressive to the other country. And it was decided by all of these countries that that was not a really good thing to do. And so, you know, this brings us to yet another aspect of this uh, about back then, there was, wasn't as much space capability as there is today. That's beginning to expand, in fact, more countries having access to space. And so now that brings up the issue of what, whether we need to go back and revisit the Outer Space Treaty from 1967. And mm -hmm. turns out the United Nations has said, yes, we do need to revisit this because there is now a bunch of gray area about what is military use of space? And do we have any situations that have occurred recently that might be considered to be partially militaristic? So yeah, I think we're gonna see some changes in the Outer Space Treaty over the next several years. And there's an interesting question that just popped up that was actually a very similar to a question that I was gonna ask about, you know, laws in space and who owns a piece of space, right? Because I think it also gets you think about satellite technology and other um, um, advancements that are occurring across different you know, parts of the world. And you know, where you mentioned this word or phrase gray areas, like how, how is all of this really going to play out as countries uh, really continue to advance their space programs, space exploration, space technology, uh, and things of that nature? Well, that's a, that's a great question because you know what? We can ask every country in the world to sign on to an agreement through the UN that says we won't use space for military purposes. But a couple of things have to happen. Number one, we have to define what military use of space is. 
That's mm -hmm. not really clearly defined right now. So let's take, for example, GPS. Everybody knows that a GPS system that is space based on satellites is really great for helping us find our way from home to the nearest pizza shop. Fabulous. Or maybe we want to drive across country. But if you consider using GPS as a way to accurately target a location on Earth that, you know, a country might want to bomb or something like that, does that then constitute a militaristic use of space? And how do you separate out how the satellite gets used for that? So that's a, that's a, that's a question that has to be considered right there. On the other hand, you know, you could say a country that might want to destroy one of its own satellites, like China did in 2007, or Russia did just last month, uh, with a missile from Earth, from the surface here, does that constitute a militaristic activity? Uh, mm. After all, you know, the spacecraft was broken up into a number of pieces, and they all essentially become little bullets like we spoke about last month. So, you know, maybe there is a real need to figure out how we then enforce this. I'm not sure there's, uh, I'm not sure we have a mechanism yet for how to enforce that, even though a new branch of the United States military is now the Space, Space Force. Force. Yeah, Space Force. Space Force. Yeah. So I don't think they have patrol cars yet and <laughs> uh, ways to actually police this. But it looks <laughs> as if we're going to need to do, uh, need to make some changes mm -hmm. and see if we can figure out the newer ways to uh, formulate agreements that, that might stick. So just another sort of add to this conversation is so we're talking about the militaristic aspects of these of this um, topic i'm curious too about the commercial aspects of this topic too because you think about space tourism and how that is evolving what does that then mean for how commercial entities let's say for example i jump on a you know, me and my buddy Bezos jump on, on one of his carriers to the moon and we want to hang out at the, uh, you know, uh, Crescent uh, uh, Resort. And, you know, who, who, gets, who gets to establish where and how things are developed? And so, it, 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 yeah, this, there's a cascade of various questions here that I think are all interrelated. Yeah, that's true. It's and no, right, right now, all it's all the all the OST, the Outer Space Treaty says is that you can't have nuclear weapons in space, and you can't use it for militaristic purposes, and and also you can't buy land on the moon. But if you wanted to go visit, or you want to go explore, or you want to do scientific research, as long as it's not militaristically based, right now. It's perfectly fine to drink and fly once you've gone to your <laughs> bar on the moon. That Derek, is this just about the moon or does the current space treaty apply to say Mars as well as we're thinking about expanding our horizons? Yeah, that's, I think that's probably the most interesting question of all, does it apply anywhere else? And yes, it applies to all of the bodies of the solar system. Uh, we, no, no country can own any of those. And the, you know, there's a really interesting connection to, you know, just, everyday living here on earth too. If you have a, if you have a contract that says you own a piece of property, well, you can own that piece of property because the government, the sovereign government of the country in which you're purchasing this has given that land to be owned and used by you. And since none of the bodies in space have been taken over, have, have, have been given to a country or assigned to a country to be owned and then given, you can't actually own it. So again, it comes down to how do we enforce this? Or is it all just on the honor system? And so far, we've been doing okay, sort of. But there's a little bit of a gray area that we have to watch out for and uh, be careful of people trying to take advantage of those gray areas. Eric, all I can think about is all of those stars that have been named that technically people don't actually own. Um, yeah. But so I have a question about this treaty. Um, like you said, it seems really ambiguous. Do you think it was written to be so? Because like we said, 1967, we didn't really know much about space. Do you think mm -hmm. it's so we can allow for science to kind of like catch up with where we were? I think the way it was written was specifically focused at telling the United States and telling the Soviet Union that they couldn't use space as a platform 
to attack the other country or any other countries around the planet. I think that's what it was really intended for at that time. Mm. And like you said, Emily, since we didn't have you know, much else going on in terms of space exploration at that time, we simply didn't know, you know what the further ramifications were, except that we wanted it to be treated much like Antarctica is, research for, for research only, not to be militarized, not to be owned by anybody else. And that was the model that was available at the time. And so here we are, you know, 60 years later. Time to rethink. Time to rethink. Is this the I, I, I'm a little disappointed that like, you know, your certificate of like, you, you, you own this little piece of the moon, <laughs> this crater on the moon doesn't come with its own like Zillow listing. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately it doesn't. And for those people that actually uh, have quote unquote purchased stars, yeah, well, all you really did was you simply purchased a spot in a book that lives on a shelf at the Library of Congress. And since nobody can own stars, you can't own a star either or have it named for anybody. I mean, you can, you can assign a name to it, but it's not official in any way, shape or form. But it's, I think it's still a wonderful way to recognize you know, a loved one or some particular you know, special event in life. So, that's all cool. Just don't. But, uh, yeah, and I think it's encouraging apply. that you know there there are these like international efforts to to be forward thinking about you know how we use space, rather than you know leave it leave it to you know first come first serve. Yep, yep. We we really need to do this because when you think about the amount of space junk that's out there and the ease of access to Earth orbit now, as we've seen with some of these recent flights of uh, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic and SpaceX we really need to put a lot more thought into what could happen in the future and protect against that because, you know, mm. protagonists will be uh, who they are. So, or antagonists will be who they are. So we, mm -hmm. we think about that seriously. All right. Well, thanks, Derek. That was a window into an aspect of law that I had never thought about before. <laughs> that was fascinating. And don't forget to keep those payments coming for that land I did lease to those who <laughs> Flag. <laughs> All right. So I'm up next, and I'm really excited about the story that I have to share with you. Um, so just a, a quick refresher on type one diabetes, because we've made a there's there's been a really cool breakthrough in a potential um, future cure for diabetes announced earlier uh, um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so diabetes, type one diabetes rather, is when your body mistakenly attacks and destroys the insulin producing cells in your pancreas. Um, and so if those cells are gone, then insulin is required for your cells to actually take up the sugar in your bloodstream from what you eat and actually use it for energy. So without insulin um, producing cells, you have no insulin. So your, your sugar just stays in your blood um, and you can't, your body can't actually use it for energy. So that's a life-threatening condition. Um, and over one and a half million Americans have type one um, diabetes. So it you know, affects a lot of people, but we don't really know why it develops. And there ha up to this point, there has been no cure. Um, so for anybody out there who's living with type one diabetes, you know that it is a lifelong, um, you know, really management disease where you constantly have to watch what you're eating and monitoring your glucose levels. Um, and so it, it really affects people's quality of life. So what was exciting is that a couple weeks ago, it was announced the first patient in a clinical trial to look for what we call a functional cure for diabetes was actually making their own insulin producing cells. Um, so this is, this is a big deal. <laughs> um, so let me talk about what this particular treatment is. Um, in this patient um, who's enrolled in this clinical trial, um, he was given um, insulin producing cells that were derived, that were grown from embryonic stem cells that were treated in a lab to turn into these, these pancreatic cells that can produce insulin. And so he was then given these um, insulin producing cells um, and now his body has started to produce its own insulin with these external cells. Um, the downside is that he has to also take immunosuppressant drugs 
Um, because these are foreign cells and just like an organ transplant, he runs the risk of his body rejecting them as, as foreign cells. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's, it's a huge breakthrough. This is fascinating. So, so you're, you made the point earlier when you introduced the topic that this is for type one and not for type two. That's right. Sorry. So type one is one that's genetically, you're, or, oh man, it's, it's, because I know there's, <laughs> Um, so, so yes, between type one and type two, let's talk, let's just briefly talk about those differences. So type one is when your body cannot produce its own insulin. Um, so that's why being able to replace those insulin producing cells or provide supplemental insulin, um, can help, um, kind of replace that function. Um, with type two insulin, it's a little bit more complicated because your body still makes its insulin, but your body is becoming resistant to insulin. Um, so just replacing the insulin producing cells is not going to be a cure for type two diabetes. So this is specific to type one. Okay. Now one is one. So between chronic and acute is type two chronic. They're both chronic diseases. They're both chronic. Okay. They're both like, so we think about acute disease as something that is often, you know, like, um, you know, triggered by a particular, you know, bacteria or virus that, you know, either you can either treat or, you know, eventually, you know, you know, your immune system fights off and then you're healthy again. So any chronic disease is something that's just going to be with you lifelong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is huge. I got to say, Jadri, I am absolutely jazzed about these embryonic stem cells that were used for this. So what's, what's the story with these? Are these embryonic stem cells particularly oriented towards doing this kind of work or are they programmed somehow to take this on? And if that's the case, is, can this be done with embryonic stem, stem cells for other issues? You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> that's ah, kind of okay. both, you know, what, what's, what's taken this particular treatment so long and kind of there's a really interesting backstory too here. So. So embryonic, let's explain, embryonic stem cells are stem cells that are usually obtained from in vitro fertilization clinics, um, where people who are go undergoing IVF um, to be able to have children um, no longer need extra embryos um, and donate them to research. And so this particular effort to, um, to use uh, embryonic stem cells has been going on for decades because what's special about embryonic stem cells is that in the lab, you can get them to turn into any other kind of cell in the body. Um, because think about it, when we start off as an embryo, those are our first two, four, eight cells that eventually create the rest of us. <laughs> well, so they're like non-dedicated um, sort of blank slates. Exactly. Come anything. It's like they've got all the instructions to build any part of us. <laughs> so they're programmable. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's That's not easy. It is right. not easy. <laughs> and Emily, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate this as you know, somebody who thinks about kind of like the history and the process of technology. This particular treatment um, was developed through, by a scientist named Doug Melton who, at, um, he's, he's at Harvard, um, and he was inspired to start working on this problem because his own kids have diabetes. Um, so he used to work on something else altogether. His kids were diagnosed. He's like, I'm a scientist. I can, I, maybe I can solve this. <laughs> and so he started this work on trying to get embryonic stem cells to turn into insulin producing cells over 15 years ago. And it has not been an easy journey. So I actually remember when I was in grad school, um, he was giving a talk, and this was probably around 2001, when um, restrictions were actually put on the use of embryonic stem cells in research because of some of the ethical issues around it. Um, and so I, I heard him give a talk around this time where he was talking about how he really had to set up two entirely different labs because he has some of his research that was funded through federal dollars and some of it that was on the embryonic stem cells that couldn't be funded by federal dollars. And so like, 
they couldn't even use the same paper towels. So, you know, just thinking through the logistics of, you know, what's, you know, how the research, you know, has had to progress, mm -hmm. you know, while we're having these other discussions about, you know, the role of, um, of embryonic stem cells. Jay, Audrey, a question came in that I was actually going to ask, and I think it's really important. Do they know yet that the clinical trial is done? Do they know if this is something that's going to involve constant treatment, or is it sort of like a one and done injection, or is it just too soon to know this? That is a great question. Um, so this particular patient, um, who's you know, really the first one, um, he's had these, uh, he's had the treatment for about six months right now. And, um, and the insulin producing cells are working great, but the, the constant treatment is the immunosuppressant part, which is not great, right? Because that means his body isn't, you know, as good at fighting off other diseases, um, you know, be it COVID or the common cold, right? So that's, you know, that's certainly a place where um, there's, there needs to be more work. And I think there's some really cool alternatives that, that I was reading about. And so, you know, one of Doug Melton's idea is like, what if we put these, um, you know, these external cells in what he calls like a tea bag so that like the insulin can still go back and forth, <laughs> but the cells are actually not in direct contact with the rest of your body. And so it doesn't trigger that immune reaction which is kind of a, kind of a, a cool idea. Um, but there are also other, you know, a more sophisticated idea would be to like edit those cells, you know, to do some gene editing, to take away kind of like the red flags that tell the body that it's not going on. Um, but there's also like, you know, other external like machines, devices that are now being in, developed as well that, you know, could potentially be just like a, um, you know, implanted in your body and, and be done with it. So there's a lot of other options, um, but this, this one is kind of a particularly cool story. <laughs> Am I opening a Pandora's box? If I ask a question about opening a Pandora's box of what else can be done with stem cells? That's, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so I think one of the interesting other applications that's been developing is particularly in um, for treating eye disorders. So things like macular degeneration is that can you can you generate new retinal cells and implant them in your eyes, um, you know, to to you know, treat vision disorders. It's what's been tricky um, is being able to scale up. So you know, maybe, you know, first it was hard to just like turn an embryonic stem cell into another kind of cell. But when you get to talking about treatments for lots and lots of people, there's kind of a production aspect of it too. And, you know, that's certainly still a challenge. And so there are, are other, you know, there are other tools that, you know, are, are, you know, the subject of a lot of research right now. But ultimately the idea is that, you know, research on embryonic stem cells could help us um, learn more about how all sorts of diseases occur and, you know, how can we use this kind of regenerative approach um, to, to treat them. So, you know, this is definitely a big breakthrough, not just for diabetes, but for the, you know, for the potential of what embryonic stem cells can do. I love this whole idea about programming um, cells in the body to do stuff. I think that's yeah. Just a remarkable concept. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, we have this whole like uh, you know, the more we understand about the body and how the, how it works, you know, we have this view of being able to then manipulate that. Um, and so, Emily, I think this is kind of a good segue to what you're going to show us because you have a story about you know some of the earlier efforts of you know moving us along this pathway from just living with our bodies to actually you know learning about them and treating them. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I find it, this is so fun to me because my specialty is the past, looking how we've historically done things. And so when I was trying to figure out what I could talk about today, I just, I got stuck on the idea of innovation. And you're going to hear me say that like 500 times, so bear with me. But really just innovation in the sense of humans have seen problems and they look for solutions. And so that really drew me to our medical collection. We have roughly 40 to 60 objects in the collection pertaining to medical history. And one of them is our bronchoscope. And it's a really cool piece of history because it's something we still use today. And also it has this really neat tie to the Institute. So 
to stay with me, you're getting a small history lesson in all the new science today. So I mentioned that we have this concept of humans looking for a solution to a problem. This has been true throughout all of history. Um, historically, humans have had a really big problem with suffocating and ingesting things that they aren't supposed to. Um, and in the past, before modern medicine, it was really an issue because the only two outcomes were pretty much serious illness, but more than likely death. So we see that we have this problem. We know what the problem is and we're working to find a solution for it. However, it's not until 1897 that we see a first real solution. And that's because German laryngologist, and yes, I've said that 20 times today to say it correctly, <laughs> but German laryngologist uh, Gustav Killian actually invented the first bronchoscope. All it is, is a long hollow tube that you put down your throat through your esophagus to look at your airways. However, he had his own research. He was looking at diseases. He was looking at how diseases grow, how they reproduce. He wasn't necessarily focused on the patient or the outcome of the patient. Um, so while that's happening over in Germany, over in the US, we have Dr. Shevelier Jackson. He received his, um, his undergraduate degree from what is now the University of Pitt, and he received his MD here in Philadelphia at the Jefferson Medical College. And so around 1887, he was practicing medicine. He was also a laryngologist, except his focus was the finding a mechanism or finding a way to help remove safely um, objects from people's throats. He, he was really concerned with creating a device that works for this specific purpose. So what he did was create his own version of a bronchoscope. And Jadri, I think you have an image that you can pull up for me, please. Yes. I am techno, cannot use technology on Zoom, I won't lie. So here we have, this, this one is in our collection. This is a bronchoscope created by Chevalier Jackson in 1907. The middle piece that you'll see, that's the actual bronchoscope. That's that long, flexible, or long rigid tube that would go down your throat and down your esophagus. That piece right below it, those are the forceps. Um, fun fact, he actually spent hundreds of hours practicing with peanuts. He would use the forceps to grab peanuts to learn the right amount of pressure that you have to exert with, you know, to safely remove something from a patient's throat. And the other piece of innovation that he was the first to include is that top piece up there. That's a light. Up until this point in time, the only light used for these types of procedures was on the outside of the body. So no matter what tool you were using, it was still, you're almost going in blindly because you couldn't see what you were doing. So at the time- uh, Emily, remind me, remind me what year this was? This is 1907. Wow, that's, yeah. that's a lot earlier than I realized that mm -hmm. you were sticking lights into people's bodies. That's a dry cell light, if I'm, if I'm huh. correct. I think, I think that's what that one is. And I see that there's a question about people being sedated. It was very none to very little sedation for this procedure. Um, Chevalier Jackson actually worked with a lot of kids because they like to ingest things they weren't supposed to. <laughs> um, and he actually had to have people help hold the children very, very still so that he could do this work. And it's, you can't tell from this photo, but it's not the smallest tube. So it's still not, you know, nobody really wants this, but this is, this was the practice until about the 1970s. It wasn't until 1966 that we saw what we now use today as a flexible bronchoscope. Those are much more fluid. They move, you, know, they can, you can use them through the airways. They rotate 180 degrees. Um, they have fiber optic lights on them. And they even nowadays have those tiny, tiny cameras so that you can actually see what's happening outside of the patient. But so this was the standard until the 1970s. And I, I love showing this when I talk about our historical collection because it shows us where we were and it shows us how far we've come, both medically and just with innovation and, and, and practicing science. And so I also mentioned that this, or I might not have actually mentioned this, but this has a really cool tie to the Institute. Um, so Jayatri, if you go to the next slide, I can't not talk about the collection and not talk about the Institute, I'm sorry. But this, this image is from our archives. This is taken at the Institute in 1938. We had a surgical and medical collection um, exhibit. And here on display, there, we actually had a dummy exhibit of a patient. And you can see a guest is able to look through and see how the bronchoscope would be used. And what's really neat is that that's actually Dr. Shevler Jackson to his right, showing him how to use the bronchoscope. And um, as we all know, we have our Committee on Science of the Arts. In 1929, we actually awarded him the Elliott Crescent Medal for his work with the bronchoscope. 
So it's, I just, I, I feel like it's so important to remember where we've come from in history to, to acknowledge it to where we're going. Wait, this was on display at the Franklin Institute? It was, and a fun fact, right behind, to the left of Chevalier Jackson's head, that box on the wall, that is our bronchoscope. That's the one that we have in our collection. Hmm. So from oh, a collection standpoint, cool. it's great. So we can see where it is. We know that it's been in the building, so. <laughs> Emily, that is, that is so fascinating. <laughs> that is fascinating. Wow. Jackson was a very interesting character. He was um, very aloof, very secluded. He, there was a whole book written about him, um, but he was, he was dedicated to this work. Like, this, is, this was his life work. It's impressive. Oh. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, I was fascinated to learn about this because I'm more familiar certainly with like what bronchoscopes are today, which is that, you know, like you mentioned, Emily, that kind of that flexible tube, um, you know, and being able to use it, um, you know, for more refined purposes, I guess, or like taking like biopsies and things like that, not just like, you know, getting peanut shells out. <laughs> Um, but I think what's cool though is is you can see that evolution from you know that first German lar laryngologist. Yep, you got it. <laughs> it. Took you one try. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I listened carefully. Um, you know who's thinking about that kind of basic research angle of it. You know to stepwise to Chevalier Jackson, and who now starts to apply it in this kind of you know like gross way of mm -hmm. of you know just removing objects and now and now we've come so far that you know we can we can like deliver medicines to the, directly to the lungs using a bronchoscope exactly it's it, it, it's like i keep i keep saying it's that it's that idea of we have a problem we've come up with a solution but through time as technology gets better as our scientific like discoveries get better we we learn to innovate off of those ideas and we learn to to further expand what, we, what we've known and to yeah. me that's fascinating yeah, and I like that interplay between invention and innovation, right? So invention is the coming up with the idea to solve a particular problem. And then the innovation is it's creating a le some level of ubiquity with the use of that particular technology. Yeah, it, It's great because it really bridges the past and the present because sometimes they, they can feel so separated just because of the, diff you know, just the differences in each time. But it, at the end of the day, we were doing the same thing. Very cool. I'm still having like visions of like kids. <laughs> like, being they're, they're down uns like unsedated kids. There's one more fun <laughs> fact. Um, he pulled over 2,300 objects from people's throats, um, pennies, quarters, uh, ball, like anything, you name it. And actually, the Mütter Museum here in Philadelphia has wow. all of those on collection or on display in their collection. <laughs> do, you do you recall the strangest thing he's ever had to uh, oh. extract? No, I don't recall the strangest, but um, in, in mentioning that he was a bit quirky, I mentioned that he pulled a quarter out of someone's, um, someone's child's uh, esophagus and they wanted the quarterback. And he, he proclaimed that they were just going to ingest it again and he refused to give it back to them. He instead gave them a half dollar thinking that was better, but they just wanted that quarterback. But he was adamant that he was going to retain that for his life. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right, well, on that theme of innovation Invent. and invention, Daryl, yeah. you are up last today, and this is kind of our best of 2021. Um, you've, you've been looking at a list of things that were invented in 2021, and you've got some highlights. Yeah, so thanks for that setup, both you, uh, Geoffrey and Emily. So that's true. So uh, Time Magazine uh, has produced their 2021 uh, best inventions and so I'm I there's a hundred of them and it, when you go on their website you get a sense of how they went about selecting these uh, 100 inventions they curated them and they provided some details about them on the website I had the honor of sifting through all of them and to be honest they're quite remarkable so to just come up with a couple to share with you was actually quite challenging because there's so many that are so great they range um, from looking at ways to improve accessibility to entertainment, uh, health and wellness and things like that, uh, transportation, mobility, things of that nature. So it's quite an extensive list. So I did find a couple that I think are pretty remarkable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to share my screen and uh, see if I have some success here with 
getting everybody up to speed here. Can folks see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. So again, this is Best Inventions 2021. Uh, the first one that I want to share with folks is this one here called the hands-free shoe, which has been invented by Nike. It's called the Nike Go Fly Ease. It's a hands-free shoe. So if you watch this video, you'll see here that it literally is exactly as it's described. It is a hands-free shoe. You literally just have to put your feet in there, slip it on, and it snaps to fit your foot and provides a comfortable walk or run, depending on what you're, you're interested in using the shoes for. And it really, again, this is a, a great way to think about accessibility and making, um, taking uh, shoes off and putting shoes on quite easy. So how does this work? There's actually a lot of engineering and what seems fairly straightforward and simple uh, and physics here at play. So if you look at this red piece here, this is a hinge, a flexible hinge which allows the, the shoe to snap open and close like that, as you see in the demonstration. There's also this uh, uh, tensioner band here, which you see outlining the, the lower part of the shoe. This tensioner band is what also creates the, uh, upper, the ability for the shoe to snap back. So as you see this uh, individual uh, taking their toes to pull the shoe off. So that's uh, made, um, uh, possible by the, the tension that's created by that, that almost like a rubber band, if you will. And so this that's is so just cool, like, Daryl, because it, isn't it's that like, so cool? Right. It's like it's it's not new technology, but right. I can I can you know, as you explain it, I'm I can totally see like how these parts fit together. Right. Um, and you know, it, it's not like new materials. It's not necessarily you know new science, but it's applying it sort of everyday physics to solve a problem. This is really Absolutely. Cool. It's quite remarkable, right? So this is just a picture here to kind of give you a better sense of zoom in as to what I'm describing. Uh, you saw the video. And so here again is that flexible hinge. And then this is the, uh, the tensioner. And so the two work together to allow the shoe to expand and, uh, and contract. So that's that. I think this is just fantastic, right? And it's, it's fairly straightforward and, and simple physics, but I mean, imagine something like this. What a what a life changer it would be for somebody who has a challenge putting it to, putting shoes on and and taking shoes off. And J Jack, you mentioned this, but it isn't any like new material, right? It's all materials that we've we've had access to for a while. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. Exactly. So that's that invention. So another one that I wanted to share with you is called the L'Oreal. Let's see if this will pull up the L'Oreal Water Saver. And it looks like I'm having some challenges here. Okay, so essentially what this is, is a, an apparatus that has been designed by L'Oreal uh, in um, uh, collaboration with another company. And I forget the name, I apologize for getting the name of the other company, but they're a company that makes um, um, uh, water uh, faucets and things of that nature. And so the two companies teamed up to create a technology that can significantly reduce water consumption. In fact, it can reduce and cut water consumption or usage by up to 80%. And so how does this actually work? So what happens is when water is flowing through uh, this particular system, it goes through a process called micronization. Micronization is a, is a Fancy way of saying taking, uh, reducing the particle size, a, a, a single particle down to many, many micro sized particles. And so by doing that, and by the, the, you know, the force and pressure of the water flowing through the system, you actually don't need as much water coming through in order to uh, provide the same level of rinse and all of those things that we typically use uh, you know, water for. And so this, in this context is used for salons to provide a much more sustainable approach to uh, treating uh, hair, but I could see utility in, you know, in a home where you're rinsing your hands or washing dishes in the sink or taking a shower or things of that nature. So this is quite remarkable, again, that this is able to cut water usage by up to 80% compared to standard uh, um, uh, faucets. And that's, that's really fascinating, especially as we're looking at, you know, how climate change is affecting water resources around the world. Um, you know, just being able to 
you know, in, embed this kind of technology into our everyday lives to, to make that you know, conservation easier, like that, that adds up. Absolutely, absolutely. I was, I was gonna mention that, that like with that possibly being able to be utilized in the home, so many times people are looking for ways to, to be more environmentally conscious, but it's just mm -hmm. not affordable or not, but that looks like it could be an option for people to, to move forward with. I agree. I can certainly see an application in space travel for this where water is a major issue about, you know, it costs a lot of money to send water into space. So it's better to try to recycle whatever liquids are used in space. This would be a, a great application for that. Absolutely. And on that same line, I think you can think about like for airlines as well, right? The, the on planes and things of that nature, a great sure. way to also, uh, you know, save on water consumption in that context as well. Yeah. I love this question. Um, you know, off the top of your head, what would each of you invent if you had the time and the money? Oh, wow. Uh, what would I invent? <laughs> if money was no object and I had all the time in the world? I would, I would create a teleport machine. <laughs> it would make travel I mean, so I, much easier. I think I need to just like figure out how to take embryonic stem cells and like clone myself. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough hours in the day. <laughs> I, think I, need, go ahead, Derek. I think we need a, a, a replicator. Yeah. Oh, so. you know. Mine was going to be very superficial. I would like to find a way to organize my day better. So something that can help me do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think, you know, I, I heard an engineer once talk about how a lot of their, um, their innovation is driven by what annoys you. And I always love that, <laughs> right? Like, you know, they, there are the big problems in the world, but then there are the little problems that affect all of us. And, mm -hmm. you know, solving those is just, you know, can be just as important. Mm -hmm. And to Emily's point, right, lead to something else that could become some other right. an, an innovation that transforms how we do and, and the human experience. Yep. Daryl, I also looked at this list and I was amazed at A, how many things we have in our collection that parallel these. You know, so again, we have these early iterations of them, but also there's this one that came up. It was a, a paper shoot camera and it's oh, yeah. directed out of eco-friendly stone paper. I took my notes over so I can read it. Um, battery <laughs> operated but it looks like a film camera when you print it. So I was just blown away that we're going backwards with tech, like we're going forward with technology, but to get results that we had in the past. So it's, it's really interesting to see that in some of these uh, 2021 inventions too. That's interesting. Yeah. Daryl, was there one of these that you would vote to go right to the top of the list? Oh, I knew you were gonna ask me that question, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> To go to the and top so he of the came list. prepared. <laughs> well, did I know? <laughs> I'm pretending I'm prepared. You know, that's actually a that's actually a really really hard question for me to answer because there are some that are just um, there's some overlap between some of the technologies too. So um, that is that is a, a, a part of I think the challenge here with picking the top of it. I honestly think, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm still mesmerized about by the simplicity of the hands-free shoe. I mean, it really is, right? It's it's just it it it, it it's such a. It seems like it's so simple, and in ways it is simple, but the design of it is quite remarkable, and I could see something like this really transforming the way a lot of people uh, experience, uh, you know, wearing shoes and, and have the ease that this is going to create for their lives. I think that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty huge. Yeah, you know, someone commented that, you know, I always got in trouble for doing that with my shoes when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know that like, I, I yell at my own kids, <laughs> like, ah, oh, you're, you know, you're gonna hurt your shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, Daryl, to your point that, you know, it, it can help so many people in, you know, who have, you know, who have issues with shoes for any number of reasons, right? Mm -hmm. It could be mobility issues. It could be dexterity issues. It could just be like not having learned how to tie your shoes yet, right? Right, um, right. That gets yeah. us, gets back to, you know, we think about a lot about universal design is that like mm -hmm. how, how does, you know, designing for one problem actually create solutions for lots of people. Absolutely. I love that. 
I saw that uh, flip phones were back on that list, and I would put oh, that yeah. one at the bottom of the list. Let's, let's forget <laughs> about <laughs> flip phones. <laughs> so that's okay. So so looking forward to 2022. <laughs> Maybe you're not ready for flip phones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, whatever comes out in 2022, um, we'll be here talking about it on Ben's Roundtable. Uh, we're, again, we always love to hear what you're interested in, what you're hearing. So let us know um, if there are topics you'd like us to talk about. We hope everybody has a uh, safe and healthy new year, and we will see you back here in January. So thanks again for joining all of us on Ben's Roundtable here at the Franklin Institute. So long. <laughs>